This is the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. Anthony Burgess was one of the most important and prolific British writers of the 20th century. Most famous for his dystopian vision, A Clockwork Orange, he wrote 33 novels, 25 books of non-fiction, and over 250 musical compositions. This podcast aims to illuminate Burgess's life and work, and his connections to other 20th century literature, film and music. So join us as we explore the world of Anthony Burgess. I'm Andrew Biswell, the director of the Burgess Foundation, and in this episode of the podcast we're going to explore Chatsky, Anthony Burgess's translation of the stage comedy by Alexander Griboyadov. This version of the play was first performed in 1993, and it's recently been published for the first time by Salamander Street. To find out more about the play, I spoke to Anna Aslanian, the writer and translator, who joined me down the line from London. First of all, I asked Anna to say something about the original 19th century play, Gor ot Uma, a title which is sometimes translated as Woe Out of Wit. So the um, uh, magnum opus, um, which Alexander Grubayedov is mainly famous for, uh, is uh, a comedy whose Russian title is uh, Gore ot Uma, which uh, literally is translated into English as uh, Woe from Wit or Woe Out of Wit. Um, that's a uh, um, play which was written in the early 19th century, between 1822 and 1824, uh, by Alexander Grybayedov. He was, at the time, a young diplomat uh, who was making an impressive career uh, with the with Russia's uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. But his main passions were poetry and music. And uh, in 1823, uh, hundred, uh, 200 years ago, he... Um, returned from Persia, where he had been uh, engaged in a diplomatic service. Uh, He returned to his uh, native Moscow, and he brought a manuscript with him. Uh, It was a play which um, subsequently became one of the gems of uh, Russian literature, one of the uh, uh, well-recognized classics. Um, So in uh, 1823, um, when uh, this play first uh, made an appearance, uh, in Russia, it became, uh, you might say, an instant hit, uh, but not in any official sense. The censors banned it. It was banned from the stage, and it was uh, uh, to stay uh, banned for uh, a few more decades. But uh, it was widely read. People were uh, reading it in uh, literary salons of Moscow and St. Petersburg. They were making copies of it, so it became a literary sensation. The uh, uh, protagonist of the play, whose uh, name is Jesse, is a young man who perhaps it wouldn't be too much of an overstatement to say that he is a fictionalized version of Ribayedov himself. So he, um, at the start of the play, which is uh, um, confined to, the action is confined to basically one day. Um, so he returns to Moscow from somewhere abroad, from his travels. And uh, what he finds there, what he sees around him, uh, is a world that thrives on corruption, a world that is uh, ruled by ignorance. Uh, and this young man is disillusioned with it all. He uh, uh, rails against a uh, society which is alien to him. So in a nutshell, it's a play about a uh, conflict between the old and the new, society and the individual. But perhaps um, uh, Burgess captures it uh, really well, uh, captures the plot really well in um, his foreword to his translation, where he says, the play must always seem topical since it is about the failed attempt of an intellectual rebel to indent the smug and philistine society in which he finds himself. The plot of the play is quite simple. Chatsky returns to Moscow after a few years absence. He's in love with Sophie, whom he's known since they were at school, but in his absence, she has fallen in love with Molshalin, her father's secretary. Chatsky discovers the relationship and delivers a series of angry monologues against hypocrisy and everything else he finds lacking in the society of his day. Chatsky is an intellectual hero and a rebel. He rails against the customs and traditions of the Philistine society in which he finds himself. 
Burgess describes this play as the Russian Hamlet. It's as famous to Russian speakers as Hamlet is in English and the source of many famous quotations. Some of the lines have become proverbial. Here's Anna with more about the significance of the play. Uh, for two centuries now, uh, Gloria Toma, the uh, social satire, has held an absolutely unique place in uh, Russian culture, in Russian literature. I can't think of any other work of literature that has uh, given rise to so many uh, popular proverbs. Uh, there are numerous lines in the text of the play that um, have now transcended the uh, original setting. They are no longer confined to the pages of uh, uh, books. Um, they have become part of the living Russian language. People quote uh, lines from the play uh, sometimes subconsciously or unconsciously. Uh, sure enough, it has been part of the school curriculum first in uh, pre-revolutionary Russia, then in uh, the USSR, and then in uh, post-Soviet Russia. So in theory, uh, most Russian speakers, or quite a few of them, would have read it at school. But when people actually use those proverbs, it's not because they remember a particular bit from their textbook. Uh, it has now become part of the oral tradition. These are the lines that get spread uh, by word of mouth. They are now part of the language itself and part of uh, uh, people's speech. Um, and um, they can be about anything. Uh, there are, because in, in the Gribeira text, there are lines for every occasion. Uh, starting from the title, Gore Otoma, is uh, a very popular way of saying in Russian that someone is too clever for their own good. So that's one catchphrase which is extremely uh, um, widespread. Burgess knew the play from an earlier English translation by Joshua Cooper, but he also knew that the original Russian text was written in rhyme, and he thought Cooper's prose translation had dodged out of representing the poetic vision of Griboyadov's original work. Here's an example of Burgess's version. In this scene, Chatsky is complaining about the fashionable obsession with French culture among the Russian elite. A little Frenchman from Bordeaux, puffed up, rotund, one of the tribe who know their own superiority, had quite an assembly around him, while he told how he was trembly with apprehension, off to barbarous Russia. But all he found was kindness, such a crush, a crowd, a cram of hospitality. I'm still in la belle France, oui, mes amis. Nothing but French, the food, the conversation, the ladies' dresses. All this imitation makes him a kind of king of the imitated. France, ah, lovely France. They were elated, these young princesses, reared on Francomania. Russian, Siberia, Latvia, Lithuania, all rubbish. Me, I stood some way away, and meekly, audibly began to pray that the good Russian god might strike and slay this damned civility, these xenophiles, who lard their lardy jowls with smirks and smiles whenever anywhere but here is mentioned. Abroad, ah, Europe. Europe is the French, and any nation properly gallicized. They call me bigot. What of the despised race of the obscurantists when I say that Russia should pursue the Russian way? We drop our customs, ancient holiness, our noble language and our northern dress, scraping our chins powdered like babies' bums, aping each little crowing cock who comes from France. Can you translate mademoiselle, madame? Such terms cannot be rendered well into the barbarous Russian tongue. Oh, God, I say, try Sudarinia. They, how odd, oh, what a joke. It's not enough to scoff. They laugh their wretched Frenchified heads off. I think of a reply. They go away. Anyone who has anything to say, home-brewed, true Russian from the Russian soul, the Russian soil, can go and dig a hole, shove himself in it. Let him be so bold as wish to tell the world, lo and behold. Lo and behold. This wasn't the first time that Burgess had used rhyming couplets in his theatre work. His earlier translation of Cyrano de Bergerac was written in the same form. 
I asked Anna Aslanian to tell us more about the qualities of Burgess's translation. I still think that his translation um, stands out from the rest. And um, uh, for my money, it's the best that you can get. So he um, um, did go for rhymed verse. And uh, it wasn't very easy to mirror the original in that regard. Because um, uh, in English, there are far fewer rhyming words than there are in Russian. So that obviously limited Burgess and his movements. It forced him to settle for half rhymes uh, sometimes and uh, also to rephrase, which I think he would have done anyway for other reasons. So um, when you read this translation, when you read Burgess's jazzy, freewheeling um, version, you can always feel his excitement. He is really happy to have this opportunity to uh, coin his own poems uh, and to try and uh, outface the original. Uh, if we think of uh, Grybayedov's uh, most famous famous lines as um, uh, verbal gems, then Burgess picks up each of these gems and he kind of polishes it again, uh, goes very carefully about presenting it in the new light. Uh, when, whenever he comes across a good soundbite, he often adds his own flourishes. Uh, for instance, this uh, memorable line, which in Burgess's translation is, sounds as follows, the best place is where none of us morons are. There's no morons in the original. He just throws it in for good measure to keep the meter flowing, but also, importantly, to reiterate the point made in the title. Um, so I'd say that Burgess's translation is probably the most liberal and also the best. He uh, takes lots of liberties, but they are justified. His choices are, to me, uh, for the most part, uh, very apt and um, they are ultimately aimed at recreating the same uh, feeling, the same perception. So clearly Burgess needs to change something in this old play and he's very aware of the fact that were he just to translate it pretty much word for word I mean he's a, an experienced translator and he knows that such a thing as uh, word for word translation doesn't exist but were he to stick to the original pretty closely uh, that would have never got him anywhere he himself says uh, again in the same forward to the um, translation which is included in uh, the edition of the play um, published this month, he says, my concern is to maintain such closeness as is compatible with a visible acting version. But a number of Grebayedov's references cannot be well understood without special historical indoctrination. So he knows that he's uh, dealing with an old text, but at the same time, it's not a dead text. It's a living play. It's something that has become uh, part of uh, Russian culture, the Russian language. So there is this uh, tendency to update the language, uh, even though the play is still very much alive and uh, everything in it is uh, very accessible. The first performance of Chatsky took place at the Almeida Theatre in London on the 11th of March, 1993. This was part of a renaissance of the theatre under the joint artistic direction of Jonathan Kent and Ian McDermott. Other plays in the 1993 season at the theatre included Diana Riggs' performance in the Greek tragedy Medea, Harold Pinter appearing in his own play No Man's Land, and Penelope Wilton starring in The Deep Blue Sea by Terence Rattigan. After a five-week run at the Almeida, Chatsky went on a six-week tour to theatres in Oxford, Richmond, Brighton, Newcastle, Malvern and Bath. Jonathan Kent was a very experienced actor and Chatsky was one of his first credits as director. The role of Molshalin was played by Jonathan Cullen, who joined us down the line from California. I began by asking Jonathan about the rehearsal process. I remember it being honestly slightly fraught because there were many, many, as you say, it was a wonderful cast, but there were many different people, very different, drawn from all sorts of different theatrical traditions. So you had, you know, Murray Melvin, who'd come out of Stratford East back in the grand old days. I'm trying to think of Joan Littlewood. You know, he was he was a core member of that Joan Littlewood company, which I knew nothing about really at the time. 
um, but would sometimes talk about that. So it came out of one tradition of making theatre. You had somebody like Dinsdale Landon, who was absolutely out of, you know, classic, the actor laddie out of the old West End tradition and carried all of that sort of fruity, uh, this is the way we do it, dear boy, thing. And then you have somebody like um, Rosalind Knight, who for me was a kind of core, beautiful core member of the company and a wonderful resource because she was shrewd and funny and very intelligent about theatre making and took no prisoners and just absolutely reliable and professional and I, I know was a great support for Gemma as well. And I think Minnie too would say the same. She became this anchor for me or a rock as it were because she was so steady and intelligent about how to handle the vicissitudes of the rehearsal process because some people worked one way other people worked another way then there were things like for example i didn't discover till much later but jonathan had cast the little princesses individually they'd all gone in had an audition uh, read for the role uh, and one of them reported to me that she arrived for the first read through and looked around and realized, oh, he's cast three fat girls um, and he didn't tell me. And I would have liked the chance to decide whether or not to take the role on that basis because the gag is that we're all fat. The gag isn't that we're all quirky, individual, peculiar, you know, good actors. The gag was basically that they're all plump. Um, and, uh, you know, so there was, if you have that, the person who told me said, you know, I thought of walking out that morning and I was really in two minds whether to carry on rehearsing because it felt like she'd been, uh, uh, you know, she'd taken the job under false pretenses because the understanding was she was cast for her talent rather than her size. Uh, so you had things like that going on, simmering in the rehearsal room, and then you'd have people who had quite small roles but wanted them to be big roles, you know, and there's a lot of small roles in it, particularly in the second half, um, when you get into the public ball scenes and the, you know, the party scenes. And it, it became, you know, lots of people sitting around twiddling their thumbs and doing the crossword grumpily in the corner, and then going, right, okay, finally, it's time to rehearse my scene and my chance to shine, at which point everyone was making a bid to pull the spotlight towards them which I think is probably what Jonathan wanted because he wanted a series of very different, quirky, odd performers, um, big performers. Um, but he, he, he never really conveyed that or was honest about that, if, if you like. Um, and that's perhaps it's interesting to hear you say that it was one of his first directorial productions because I, I didn't know that and nor did he say that. Uh, it seemed like he was very at home in a rehearsal room and very happy to be up there leading the show, directing the show. But um, I think it might have been quite helpful, actually, if he'd if he'd said, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite new to this, so cut me a bit of slack that way. Um, so I remember it as being a quite a complicated rehearsal. The problem was we had several different complicated people in the cast, and uh, some who wanted to be a part of the collectivity, and others who wanted to make their performance alone. And so it. it it uh, it was not a happy production, I'd say, in those ways. Um, my memories of it are pretty good, in as much as there was a little group of four of us, me, Gemma, Minnie, and Colin, who on the tour bonded together and we actually, you know, rented houses together in various places. Like I remember a little cottage in Malvern where we um, had fun and went for walks and things. Uh, but it there was a necessity to do that was to form a small um, protective society around Colin and the two younger women um, that way. So that's a long rambly answer, but it's to say it was a, a complicated and difficult rehearsal process. Chatsky has a very large cast and the 1993 production included Minnie Driver in her first appearance on the London stage and Gemma Redgrave as Sophie. The role of Chatsky was played by Colin Firth, who went on to become internationally famous for his roles in television and film, but in 1993 he was not yet at the height of his fame. 
I asked Jonathan Cullen about his memories of working with this cast of up-and-coming actors. He wasn't yet Mr Darcy, obviously, but he had a kind of a profile. He was, as he told me, I'm very big in Japan. And we met a couple of young Japanese fans who started weeping um, uh, and laughing. I mean, they were literally hysterical at the sight of him um, and had their photos taken with him. And I, th and I was a bit stunned by it. And he said, yeah, I'm very big in Japan. Uh, and he'd done Valmont, I guess, at that point. And I have a very clear memory of walking along uh, Upper Street behind him because we were heading for the pub or something, I can't remember. And um, seeing him, you know, 20 yards ahead of me, walk past two middle-aged couples. And as the couples passed him, they affected not to notice who he was. And then literally the moment they stepped past him, both the women, the couples, buckled at the knees and, and stared at each other and went, oh my God, like that. Um, and then walked past me, indifferent, obviously. <laughs> um, but I remember thinking then, gosh, this is this is a sort of a phenomenon. Uh, because he wasn't, he's not particularly charismatic in real life, but he's very charismatic on stage. So uh, I think, you know, in a sense, what the play was, was it was, it was a fair deal to title it, to retitle it Chatsky, because it's all about that complicated hero of the play. And Colin was the person who carried the weight of making the play work that way. And I think he felt that somewhat. So, you know, he took personal responsibility for some of the things that were going wrong in the production and tried to put them right uh, and, and struggled a little bit with that, I think. In the play, the hyper-articulate main character Chatsky is a precocious 19-year-old who's been working abroad in the diplomatic service. Like Hamlet, his intelligence and caustic way with words are mistaken for madness by the figures who surround him. Chatsky's intelligence is reflected in the virtuosic language that Griboyadov gives him, an element of the play that Burgess emphasises in his creative translation. Here's Anna Aslanian to tell us more about this aspect of Burgess's adaptation. So Burgess uses a number of um, solutions which allow him to update the text, to tart it up a bit, to make it a bit more suitable for um, the contemporary audiences. And, um, uh, anything to make sure it doesn't just uh, stay slightly dusty and uh, boring as a period play written nearly 200 years ago. Um, another of his innovative uh, touches is alliteration in um, the Russian tradition, especially in uh, the theatrical tradition. It's not as important as it is to... Um, it's uh, English uh, counterpart. So uh, there isn't a huge amount of alliteration in the original, but Burgess goes for it big time. And he has, on the same page, he will have things like groan, grip, and grovel. And then he has rakes and rogues and rips. Then he has cocksure, cockiness. And then he, said, he has things like shrieking, shifting, choking, shoving elsewhere. So those are clearly flourishes that he enjoys introducing into the text. Again, he knows very well what he's doing. It's not just uh, uh, that he's lost for ideas. These are the ideas. The ideas are to update and um, um, modernize the text uh, and also to anglicize it. Uh, not too much. We are still uh, aware of the fact that the action takes place in a a faraway country and in a completely different era, but um, it does become more accessible. It becomes funny. It becomes something that can be performed. And for Burgess, it was a very important thing. Uh, things had to be performable, actable. Uh, one of the translations um, that of uh, the same play that he had read before starting uh, working on it was uh, by uh, Joshua Cooper. And uh, it's not that Burgess didn't like it. Uh, it was done in prose, and there were some um, strengths to it. I think Burgess does comment on that, but he also calls it unactable. So this is ultimately the goal. It has to be something uh, created for the theatre, and there have, they have to be good lines in it, there have to be punch lines, there have to be lines that are definitely going to 
make the audience laugh. And this is what he's trying to achieve. Um, so all these bold choices uh, allow Burgess to retell the story the way he likes, uh, conveying the plot, maybe slightly unfaithfully, but wittily. And that's what ultimately matters. The linguistic richness of Burgess's translation presented some difficulties for members of the cast when it came to performing the play, as Jonathan Cullen remembers. The issue with a highly literary, a highly crafted translation like that is that you you can't hit every one. You have to decide which ones are going to work and which aren't, and which you'll just skim lightly out into the audience like a frisbee and hope someone catches it. And then there are the others that you, you know, do a more or less a drum roll and a ta-da. Uh, as you produce them. So there was very much, uh, that was both a directorial and uh, actually at some level a personal choice about how much you lean on things and how much you let yourself be seduced by the language. Because, you know, the danger in a situation like that is that it becomes all about a mass of words, a, a sparkly mass of words thrown into the air, and you lose a sense of impetus for the story and you lose actually what the, what is happening in the story um so you know from my point of view i really had to concentrate strongly on where he was going what he wanted in each scene and what he wanted in you know uh, out of life as it were who there's a he's a classic social climber that way so my focus i tried to stay focused on on his wants and desires and that he you know, I, I didn't get so much of the word players as, as some other people did, like David O'Hara's character, you know, was was very wordy and obviously Colin's character is. It was difficult to learn is the, uh, the other, the really simple answer is it was a bit difficult to learn um, in parts because you think, why has he chosen this word? What's the specificity of this word? But then once, you know, in a sense, I say it's difficult to learn, it was puzzling to learn. And then it became easy because you'd made choices about pretty much every word. Here's another one of Chatsky's monologues from Act 4 of the play. In this extract, Chatsky is renouncing his place in the Russian elite and saying a final farewell to life among the generals and princesses in Moscow. I don't quite understand. I'm being chidden, but there's another message, sort of hidden, that I'm still not clear when it comes out of hiding. I'm on an insubstantial horse and riding in the wrong direction. It's been a long, long day. I came in innocence. Ignorance. Poured away my heart's blood down the drain in a passionate tumble. The words went clattering, wholly heartfelt, humble on you, you, you. You led me on, unscrupulous. If you said the chance was gone, that would have been, well, that. You could have said our past together was a joke. The dead memories, a stale jar of potpourri, but the past doesn't die. Alive in me, I thought it was alive in you. You could have said, and I would have understood. My reappearance was not just surprising, but sickening. Yet you were disguising revulsion at my acts, my thoughts, my words. Then, though belated, I would have joined the birds that migrate from our winter, smelt the cold, and flown. Well, creep in your cell. You've sold potential sweetness to a slavering clown. You'll think a little, cool your anger down, forgive him, seek a double resuscitation, for why should you destroy yourself? Your station in life is long decreed. The Moscow lady, whose vital patterns come to her ready-made. He will be the lapdog, errand boy, whipping boy, fusion of slobbering slave and tatty toy, the ideal Moscow husband. My lady's page, and all you'll need to read. I've cooled my rage, reverted to indifference, spoken, broken with my past dreams. A future has awoken, for you too, little father, one in which a more acceptable dog will sniff the bitch on offer. An obsequious operator, oily and smooth, prototypical head waiter, worthy of the man he waits on. He will devastate his father-in-law to be. You worship rank. Well, he'll be rank all right. Doze on, doze on. The real world's bugs won't bite. Your pillow is the ignorance of bliss, bliss of ignorance. Enough of this. Dream on. I've had my dreams. My eyes are wide open. 
They look amazed at the world outside, the world of father, daughter, brainless lover, the whole damned boiling, I mean damned. Take cover. I'll fire the cannon of my long frustration. Or will I? Yielding to fate's dispensation, I accepted a hell of curses, persecutors, treachery, lechery, sneerers, liars, looters, rooters out of scandal, the beam in the eye unseen by the moat hunters. All the sly and sinister, the scandal dandlers, drooling old fops that have our destinies for ruling. Old rattled dames that plot and plot. Your world, curled up in your own rottenness. You hurled the libel of my madness like a brick to smash my window. If to be sane is sick, I revel in my sound insanity. Breathe your air. Eat your victuals, nod at your nonsense, read the weedy garlands of your triumphs round my head, and think to hear a rational sound from your cracked vessel. Good. You're sane. I'm mad. Moscow is bad. The whole world may be bad. But somewhere there must be a nook, a niche, where sanity is let off from the leash. The brain can breathe. I'll ride this way no more. Farewell. Fare ill. Why should I care? Send for my carriage. Carriage! When the play was performed in London in 1993, it was greeted by rave reviews. As Jonathan Cullen remembers, the subsequent tour had mixed responses from audiences. You know, when you get good reviews for a show, particularly a show that you yourself are not sure about whether it's working, which I think is, you know, my sense as we approached the production was that the cast were quite anxious as to whether or not we had a show that's that was working Um, and so to then get the endorsement of the good reviews from the critics which was obviously in 1993 that was really what mattered because there was no internet there wasn't you know people didn't access um, their information about things through social media in the same way as they do now Um, then the critics were hugely powerful and you depended upon them for your audience really Um, so to get rave reviews which we did uh, you know rave enough anyway meant that the show was full and people come if people come expecting a great show then to some degree that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because they're ready to seek what enjoyment they can in the play and they don't want to feel foolish it's like the emperor's new clothes you know it's you, you want to sort of admire the the new clothes and in this case i'm not saying there wasn't a production there was a great uh, a beautiful production which was you know f- f- full throatedly acted by all involved and when you're going out on a limb like that and going i'm doing i'm taking some strong acting choices it's very nice to be able to lean on the audience's approbation that way so my memory of it is that it was great to get the full houses full enthusiastic houses in london And then that was the problem was then we went out on tour expecting that same level of engagement with the play right from the start. And and you could feel people sitting there more or less with folded arms going, hmm, okay, what is this that we've come to see? Why are we here? What, who, what are we seeing? There was a slightly speculative aura about the audience, it always seemed to me. The other thing I remember is that it it went down very differently in different places. Uh, And that's partly, I I suppose because of the venues we were in perhaps or the catchment around those venues so in Malvern my memory of it in Malvern is that it was just pretty grim nobody really wanted to come and see that show and didn't enjoy seeing it and were grumpy afterwards Bath it was much better for some reason the the theatre held the show much more and suited it more I mean Bath Theatre Royal is a beautiful little theatre, like sitting inside an 18th century grenadier's drum or something. And, you know, there's all this red velvet and gold. And so there was a there was a continuity of design from the stage through into the auditorium and a kind of consistent aesthetic that way. And it was small enough that when Colin got down the front and stood there with his lovely long legs and his dark coat and did all his emotions and things at the front there, people were swooning. But when you're playing, you know, Newcastle Theatre Royal, it's a very different matter. Um, I was doing my role in Geordie. I'm from Newcastle originally, 
and I chose to do it with a hint of a Geordie accent. So that, you know, there was this sense that he was not quite the same class as the others. Um, and of course, that was fun <laughs> to take it back to Newcastle was was really nice because I could feel that actually for the first time there were people out there who were cheering for me, you know, so that that felt nice. Um, but the yeah, the, t the tour was long and and tiring. Honestly, I think the run at the Almeida would have been perfect if you could have stopped then. There was a general feeling, I wish we'd just done the Almeida and not done the tour. Because the Almeida, we went out on an absolute high and it had been a vast, a huge success. And then the tour became uh, a teeth gritting slog by the end, um, just to get to the end. And we were counting, counting it down. So that was, that got to be quite hard work. But I look back on it very fondly now, of course, and, and, and stayed friends with lots of people. I am still friendly with some people in the cast, you know, 30 years later. Uh, and I stayed friends for quite a while afterwards with several people, um, notably Ros Rosalind Knight, who was just utterly wonderful. And we used to call her the Admiral um, because she was, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, ran the show. And lovely John Fortune, who I shared a dressing room with, who would talk fondly about his parrot and how his parrot's head smelled of honey. And I think he brought the he brought the parrot in at one point so that we could all see what he was talking about. So. Yeah, there were some great characters in the show, beautiful people. So I'm very, I have very fond memories in amongst the um, sense of it having been a slog. Chatsky is an example of Burdus's engagement with Russian language and culture, which began with his visit to Leningrad in 1961. That trip led to the development of the special language in A Clockwork Orange. Burdus read widely in classic Russian literature, and his discovery of Griboyadov's play emerged from his knowledge of the important works in the canon. When Burgess was working on Chatsky, he and his wife Liana made a recording of the entire play, and this survives in the Burgess Foundation's archive. Here's Burgess and Liana reading the scene in which Chatsky makes his first entrance. The sun's up, but you cast a fire glow on this, your servant kneeling at your feet. Figuratively speaking, come a kiss. We meet after an endless parting. Were you not expecting me? Not one solitary jot of pleasure, just a cold trickle of surprise. Heat in your cheeks, but not much in your eyes. Or I think a week, even a day had passed, so we had more the time away. Love, I expected love. Swiftly I come, wrapped in a traveller's delirium. Forty-five hours without a week of sleep. Five hundred miles, my carriage, buried deep in snow or lashed by blizzards. Soaked in rain, wheels broken, mended broken, and my brain dazed with desire to get to you. Devotional that's earned at least a modicum of emotion. Mr. Chatsky, I'm very pleased to see you. That's something. But if you were me and me, you, would that be enough? How's one supposed to act when one is really pleased? Is it the fact that I've exposed myself to lethal immersion in icy rivers just for my own diversion? I say you should have eavesdropped seconds ago. We were talking about you. Isn't that so? Not only now we were talking. We talk about you always. See you in these shops, in ships, in streets, in always. Follow your shadow. Look for your shadow in travellers from foreign parts. Ask if they've been where you were. Ask captain of foreign ships if they seen you past chase of their trips. I might have believed that, so I believe I do. Blessed is the believer. What's not true can still be cosy. Well, well, back again in Moscow with you. You as you were then or not. Oh, Lord, how innocent we were. Appearing, disappearing, here and there. Romping around that table and that chair. There sat your father, there that old madame, playing at piquet. Well, we used to cram ourselves in that dark corner, safe secluded, until a creak, a croak, a cough intruded. Burgess learned Russian in something like six weeks, working from a series of vinyl records and teach yourself Russian books. In his autobiography, he describes himself as a fluent speaker of Russian. I asked Anna Aslanyan how far she believes this account. Back in 1961, he was able to uh, communicate. Uh, presumably, he didn't have a, uh, an interpreter or a fixer with him. And uh, he, when he uh, visited Leningrad uh, that year, uh, he was able to make friends. He was able to talk to people. And uh, he talks about it in his uh, autobiography. But um, there are some bits which kind of make you think, well, how good was his Russian really? And was it all uh, a bit of an afterthought? Was he 
maybe not as fluent as he uh, portrays himself uh, writing about it later. Uh, not that it matters. I mean, in the autobiography, ultimately, again, the idea for him as a writer is uh, to tell a good story. He's not going to let uh, any facts to stand in the way of this good story. So even if his Russian is a bit rusty, if he is better at uh, certain parts of uh, the Russian vocabulary than others, uh, he's probably not going to give us a very fair assessment of that. Um, so I was wondering about that, but um, it's really hard to tell uh, just based on uh, his his own reflections on, on, on that uh, visit in 1961. Another interesting thing uh, about Burgess and languages is that um, he um, wrote uh, about the difference between spoken and written language. So he, um, when, when was, uh, before he visited Russia in 1961, when he was teaching in Malaya in the 50s, he met people who could speak several languages fluently without actually having any sense of grammar and without being literate in the traditional sense of the word. So he concluded that uh, to learn a uh, spoken language, to speak a language, uh, is a very different skill from being able to write in it or read it or translate uh, into it or from it. So uh, for um, uh, spoken fluency, for you to be able to speak a language, you just need to be you need to have a good oral memory um, and uh, some kind of syntactic memory. So you need to be um, a bit like an actor who is learning their lines. Whereas um, if you are trying to work with um, a written language, then it's a completely different set of skills. So Burgess himself, despite being an accomplished musician, was by his own admission much better at reading languages than at speaking them. Um, so it may be that uh, he managed to arrive at some combination of the two. And of course, being a, a writer, he was probably more grounded and more reliant on uh, writing and reading. So my guess would be that his, um, however uh, good or bad his spoken version is, his, uh, reading skills, his uh, ability to read the text and understand, it must have been uh, uh, a few levels above that. And uh, certainly when you read his translation of um, Gloria Toma, uh, when he uh, skirts over certain bits and uh, skips over some uh, connotations which he knows he'll have to work really hard to render them into English and he'll probably need some footnotes, which of course in this context is uh, unthinkable. So you can tell that he gets everything right and he understands the, all the subtleties uh, of um, Ribayedo's original. So I'd say um, that uh, as a translator from Russian, Burgess was well placed to do a really complicated and uh, challenging um, play uh, such as Gloria Atuma. Uh, and also because uh, Burgess the translator was just as inventive, as experimental, as fearless, as exuberant as Burgess the writer, um, that was just, he was the man for the job. Although Burgess was seriously ill, he attended a performance of Chatsky and met the cast in March 1993 Jonathan Cullen remembers his meeting with Burgess at the Almeida on the press night. I want to say he was in a wheelchair and smoking, but but maybe it just felt as if he was smoking because he kind of carried that aura with him. Um, yeah, he was great. He was good value. I, I only remember him meeting him really at the press night, I think. And, I you know, it was one of those things where you're dragged over to go, come, come and meet Anthony. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think he was just doing a more or less a, a receiving line of the cast and going wonderful, wonderful, uh, all of that. So th the interaction wasn't particularly long, um, but uh, I, I do remember thinking, you know, what a what an extraordinary character he was, um, and he had this. Mm, he had a kind of quality about him as if he was thinking of lots of other things at the same time. 
which is not the same as distracted, but you could feel his polymathic quality, you know, of the man who also composes music and also, you know, is interested in this, that and the other and has written a book about Shakespeare and, you know, so on. So he, he had a huge mind that way. You could feel, and I've met a few people like that in my life, but he was strikingly that way. You know, he, he didn't have a, uh, some people have a kind of lighthouse focus so that when their beam switches onto you, you feel absolutely in the middle of their beam. And he was not like that. He was somebody who it felt was radiating all around him that way. Um, but as to what we talked about, I've no idea. I think just some, you know, you know, polite chit chat about the play and how it had gone that night and how great it was and so on. So I, I seem to remember that he was talking with the, there was a woman who was our Russian expert sitting in the room and I think she was with him as well. And did they talk in Russian possibly? So yes, not strong memories of Burgess, but, um, but he was definitely, he was definitely there and made a kind of royal progress through the Almeida bar. Now that Chatsky has been published, we hope that future performances will follow. Anna Aslanian and Jonathan Cullen are both looking forward to new productions of Burgess's play. One of my greatest regrets uh, in life is that I wasn't around in uh, 1993 to see the production at uh, the Almeida Theatre, as in I wasn't living in London at that time. It's just a question of time. I'm sure uh, there must be some efforts have to be made to uh, bring this back to the stage. Um, it's um, timeless in that it does talk about individual freedom and that's a kind of subject that people are always interested in and also equally importantly it is a very funny play in Burgess's rendition so this version deserves more than just being discussed uh, as an academic and example of our uh, very hard um, play being translated into English without losing the rhyme uh, with making certain compromises and interesting um, changes to it to keep it uh, alive in English. So I think it uh, very much deserves to be seen on the stage and uh, I for one will look forward to seeing it uh, produced in English uh, before too long. Oh gosh, I'd love to see it done. I, I'd love to see it done because you know, I have such strong memories of it, but it's it's always utterly fascinating going and seeing a play that you've been in yourself um, in a particular translation, or that I've you know I've done uh, I've been in at the creation of quite a few new plays, and then in some cases have had a chance to see them again in later years, uh, and that personally is always very fascinating. But I could never really get a sense of what they were seeing in this show because, as I say, it was. It felt disparate, um, but I could feel that the audience were getting something that we couldn't get a feel for backstage. So I'd love to sit out front and see how it hangs together and the shape of it um, and the you know design staging choices that people make. Uh, it's very, there's a lot of stretch in the play, you know, so y you could stage it many different ways. Um, I can imagine all sorts of productions of it. Uh, it's It's got lots of, um, you know, it's great tensile strength, I think, as it were, because there's a good solid core to it. But around that, you could do all kinds of things in terms of staging. So I'd be fascinated to see the choices that people make. You've been listening to the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. This episode was written and hosted by Andrew Biswell. Chatsky, translated by Anthony Burgess, is published alongside his translation of Molière's Miser Miser by Salamander Street. It's out now from all good bookshops. Our guests in this episode were Anna Aslanyan and Jonathan Cullen. Anna Aslanyan is a journalist, translator and public service interpreter. As a journalist, she has contributed to the Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian and other UK publications, writing about books and art. Her translations from Russian include contemporary short stories for Dalky Archives collection Best European Fiction, 
and Igor Kovalevsky's 19th century travel log, A Journey to Africa. Her popular history of translation, Dancing on Ropes, Translators and the Balance of History, is out now. Jonathan Cullen has been an actor for stage and screen for nearly 40 years. On stage, he has performed lead roles with the National Theatre, the Royal Shakespeare Company, and on the West End, as well as renowned theatres around the UK. He has appeared in films such as Velvet Goldmine, Finding Neverland, and Suffragette. And on television, he played King George VI in the BBC's adaptation of Len Dayton's SSGB and the Archbishop of Canterbury in the Channel 4 comedy The Windsors. He is currently based in Portland, Oregon. For more information about Jonathan, head to www.jonathancullen.org. Extracts from Chatsky were read by Paul Barnhill, who is an actor, puppeteer and the creative director of the theatre company Goofus, which can be found online at www.goofustheatre.com. For more information about Anthony Burgess, and to find out how you can support the work of the Burgess Foundation, visit www.anthonyburgess.org. If you have enjoyed this episode, why not review and subscribe at your favourite place to listen to podcasts?